2020 on ID. A teenager who hit the big time. Why well, would I hurt you? You big a father to me. A star in film and TV. But would sudden fame have a cost? No, free drugs, free booze, free women. I said, I hope we're not cursing this kid. I had the opportunities and I squandered them all away. Then, success leads to a deadly crime. How could you do this? How? A real Bronx tale. And a young woman and the two men who loved her. I was naive, very naive. I can look back and admit it. A love triangle that would turn into a deadly knot. I didn't want to believe it. My eyes were lying to me. Was it suicide? He always said that he was going to die young. Or murder. And I thought, 19-year-old kids don't pass away. Clues left behind and a chilling question. He said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? Lives cut short. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Adolescence can be a time of great promise, but for some, it's a turbulent period of rough passions and poor choices. And decisions made under the fog of youth can have deadly results. First, Lilo Brancato. His was a classic Hollywood tale, an unknown plucked from obscurity who skyrocketed to instant fame. But as Chris Connolly first reported in 2009, for Lilo, that fame came with a price. Back in 1993, as his young face lit up the screen in a book sale, 16-year-old Lilo Brancato looked to all the world like a teenager on the brink of showbiz greatness, an overnight sensation with electrifying ability. Don't fight on me! I swear, I just went right to school and that was it! The sky was limit. Really? Robert Downey, Leonardo DiCaprio, absolutely. I say that unequivocally. And I wouldn't say that about someone who didn't have the talent. He was plucked from obscurity to work with actor-director Robert De Niro and a Bronx Tales writer and star, Chaz Planteri. As we were shooting, I remember I said, I hope we're not cursing this kid. Back then, Lilo Brancato was given a once-in-a-generation opportunity in the movie business, handed the keys to the Hollywood kingdom. But 16 years later, in this place, no one is handing Lilo Brancato the keys to anything. An opportunity of any kind is nowhere to be found. All because of one night on this snowy driveway in the Bronx, where in a burst of gunfire, more than one man's dream would be shattered forever. It all started with a day at the beach. July 5th at Jones Beach. 1992. You still remember the year, you still remember the date. Absolutely. Lilo loved to do impressions for his brother Vinny, so when a Bronx Tale casting assistant came by, handing out audition flyers, Vinny spoke up. Well, I was like, wait, do Joe Pesci for me, do, you know, De Niro for him. Talking to me? And he did it, and the guy was like, wow, he goes, you gotta come down to the Bronx tonight. What's going through your head when he says this to you? You know, I call confidence, I, I kinda thought I had a shot. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Lilo took a Bronx Tale production team by storm, and he got the part. It was unbelievable. He had natural ability. It was just amazing. I said, what happened to you is, is more rare than winning the lotto. Do you understand that? You have to take this and run with it. Do the right thing. Work hard. Go to acting school. Get even better. Do everything right. Listen to me. This is a great opportunity. You can be as big as you want to be. I used to say this to him all the time. Some guys never get that shot. You know that. I know that. I just got everything so easy. It just <clears throat> came so easily for me. So easily, he seemed to take it for granted, smoking before acting this scene. Is it better loved or feared? It's a good question. What was going on with you personally during that scene? That was the first time that I ever got hot and was captured on film. And what's going on in your head at that moment? Um, what do I look like right now? Can, does, does anybody know? Does anybody know I'm high? And if you watch that scene, my eyes are glassy. I'm a dead giveaway. You know, I look like I'm half asleep. Do you think they knew? Do you think Chaz knew? I don't know if he knew exactly that, that I was high, but he knew something was off. Did you know that at the time? To be quite honest with you, I, I, I had a, a suspicion that he was. She could be such a good kid. And then the next minute, so irresponsible. It was so strange. Before the film opened, Robert De Niro came to Lilo's home 
to caution him. He mentioned the, you know, you know, the drugs. He did mention drugs. Yeah. Well, he said a lot of people are going to want to be your friends, you know, and they don't have your best interests at heart. So you got to be careful, and you got to choose your friends wisely. You probably couldn't hear a word he told you. I kind of shrugged it off. It was kind of like, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but not me. I'll be fine, Bob. Recommend alert one. Fame and success did follow. Lilo got roles in Crimson Tide and Penny Marshall's Renaissance Man. Hey, Larry. Who's an addict, Larry, huh? Your mother's in Got VIP treatment at every club in town. Let's face it, it feels, it feels great. I mean, you know, it does feel great. But after a while, I guess it gets to your head. It definitely gets to your head. Yeah, not fame itself, but it was people that changed my brother. You know, free drugs, free booze, free women. In 1999, for the Soprano second season, Lilo played a good-looking hothead of the violent streak. Get back in your office. As Lilo's own cocaine use began to intensify. Were you high when you did the Sopranos? I may have been, yes. I may have been, yes. Sometimes I would run into him at a nightclub, and at the club he'd be like, you know, running around, and I'd say, hey, take it easy, what are you doing? Settle down, relax. But He was one of those kids that just just couldn't hold it together. I don't know. It's sad, man. It's, it's, it's sad. Even as his partying continued, Lilo never even moved out of his parents' house in Yonkers. Why didn't he leave? I guess he just had a good, you know? Dinner. Whatever he needed, you know? This kid had so much natural ability, but did nothing with it. Never went to acting school, never took things seriously, never really read scripts, didn't do anything. Instead, Lilo did hard drugs full time. Instead of having two drinks, you'll have four. And then from the four drinks, then you'll sniff, you know, you snort a line of cocaine. And then from that line of cocaine to come down, you'll do some heroin. And then it, it doesn't end. The drugs always, always win. His family staged an intervention, got Lilo into rehab, but nothing took. His brother Vinny felt he knew the family secret that had driven his brother to drugs. Lilo had been adopted from an orphanage in Bogota, Colombia. You know, he'd be going to my mom's room at 3 o'clock in the morning and talking about that, you know, and being upset about him being adopted. It always bothered him. I think that was his, uh, his uh, downfall. Late in 2005, everyone saw that Lilo's need for drugs was out of control. He said, you're fooling around with heroin. And he goes, no, 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 no. And I said, listen to me now. If you don't stop this, and I've been telling you this for years, something bad's going to happen to you. By December, I was a lost cause. I was getting worse every day. Look at you. You lost like 50 pounds. You're a mess. Did you think to yourself, this is going to end really badly? I thought he was going to die. But Lilo Brancato didn't die. Somebody else did. When we come back, Lilo hits rock bottom. I was dosing. Like, I felt every ache and pain, hot flashes, cold sweats, started, like, shaking. I needed a fix. And the results are deadly. I got a couple shots by and please don't tell me something happened to my brother. Stay with us. At just 16 years old, Lilo Brancato found fame. He also sank into a life of drug abuse that quickly spun out of control. Twelve years later, the bright young star on the rise would achieve a different kind of fame. But this time, not on the red carpet. Here again, Chris Connolly. New York City's most somber public event, the funeral of a police officer, with his brethren in attendance and words from Mayor Bloomberg. The entire city took his tragic loss deeply and personally. In the fall of 2008, scores of police officers would also be in attendance at the trial of one of the men accused of murdering Daniel and Chautegui, Lilo Brancato, one-time movie star of A Bronx Tale. Each day at trial, they would applaud for Yolanda Rosa, sister to Officer Enchautegui. They call him a cop's cop. Mm -hmm. 
My brother lived and breathed being a police officer. He, that title suits him well because he was good in what he did. He was one of the good ones, you know? He loved it. He loved taking those bad guys off the street. The trial was a tabloid sensation, starring a Hollywood hotshot transformed into a desperate junkie. Hired to defend Lilo, high-profile New York attorney Joe Tacopina saw this as a case of wrong place, wrong time. Lilo was someone who uh, understood that that was his addiction that put him in the particular place that he was at that night. But he also told a story that caused me to believe he had no legal or moral involvement in the murder of a New York City police officer. On a binge at the down and dirty Crazy Horse Strip Club in the Bronx with Steven Armento, the father of an ex-girlfriend, Lilo Brancato spent the early morning hours of December 10th, 2005. By 4 a.m., the men were out of drugs and had to have more. The crack cocaine was eating the heroin to a point where I was, I was dosing. Like, I felt every ache and pain, hot flashes, cold sweats, started, like, shaking. I needed a fix. To get that fix, they went to the apartment of another Lilo pal, Kenny Scavati, who'd supplied pills to Lilo in the past. Lilo broke Kenny's window, and that awakened the officer who lived next door. He may have been off duty, but he was still a cop. So he headed outside to check, calling 911 as he did so. I'm an off duty MOS. I think somebody broke into my neighbor's home. There's glass and the window's on the floor. It would be the last phone call of his life. Seconds later, as the 28-year-old officer came upon Lilo Brancato and Steven Armento, shots rang out. I remember walking, and I remember hearing someone say, don't move, and I was startled. So I turned around quickly, and I was shot. I was shot twice, and then I just, then I just left. Westchester and Arno got a pickup of shots fired. Wounded in the chest, Lilo staggered down the driveway and into the street near his car, where he was met by police on the scene. Steven Armento was still holding his gun when he collapsed all while police tried to save the life of Officer and Shout Take. One minute out for EMS, one minute out. When did you find out that this hunt for drugs had killed a man? Someone came to the hospital bed with, with the newspaper, and he said, uh, he said, hey, buddy, you proud of yourself? He said, you and your boy just killed a cop. I said, what? A police officer. Not long after Officer Enshautegi was pronounced dead at Jacoby Hospital, cut down by bullets from Steven Armento's gun, patrolmen were waiting at Yolanda Rose's front door. And I said, the first reaction was, please don't tell me something happened to my brother. And he just said, ma'am, come with me, put your shoes on, I need you to come with me. For his involvement in Officer Enshautegi's death, Lilo's pal Steven Armento would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. The charges against Lilo were attempted burglary and felony murder. That's what the state alleged here, that during a burglary attempt, a police officer was killed and that Lilo was just as responsible as Steven Armento, the shooter, for that crime. Did you know that Steven Armento had a gun? No, I didn't. How not. could you not know he had a gun? I just didn't. I was never a gun guy. I was never into that kind of stuff. No one's saying you had it, but how could you not know that he had it? He knew that it's something that I would be against, and I wouldn't allow it in my car. Absolutely You would have said, oh, I don't mind scoring all these drugs and stuff and going yeah, places, but, that, but if you've got a gun, you can't get in my car. Yeah, that's, there's a big difference. You know, it's like already, already we have drugs in the car. People think you knew he had a gun. Of course people think that. He may be a junkie, but he's not a dummy. He knew what was going on that night. Whether he pulled the trigger or not, he committed that murder along with his buddy. Officer Courtney Mapp was just one of the witnesses whose testimony at trial filled the New York papers before the jury decided to write a surprise ending to this very different Bronx tale. Verdict in the murder trial. On the charge of attempted burglary, Lilo Brancato was found guilty. On the charge of felony murder, Lilo was acquitted. I was slapping my face. Slapping my face. 
If I could speak to Danny, I would have told Danny, do not get out of bed. My brother could have stood sleeping. He didn't have to get up, but my brother heard it. He heard breaking glass five in the morning. He got up. Before his sentencing, Lilo Brancato read a message of remorse. You said in that statement, I'm a good person. Right. How are you going to prove that to us? Police officer died. And I will always, always make sure that he's remembered for being a hero. I just want him to do the right thing. To me, it's more important right now just that he stays clean, you know? And, and if you don't, I'm done with him. He was sentenced to 10 years. You threw it away. Yeah, I did. I did. What does that feel like? You had the greatest opportunity imaginable for a great career. And here you are. I'm ashamed. I mean, I had the opportunities and I squandered them all away. I squandered it, you know. What's the last line of a Bronx tale? The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. That's your story, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Even now, at Officer Enchautegui's precinct, his locker has been turned into a shrine to honor his sacrifice. And from the man who created a Bronx tale, there is deep sympathy for Officer Enchautegui's family. For Lilo Brancato, there is only anger. He said those words in the movie. I wrote those words. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent, and the choices you make will shape your life forever. I mean, what else do you want to hear? What else do you want to know? How could you do this? How? Lilo Brancato was released from prison in 2013 after serving eight years of his 10-year sentence. Coming up, one woman, two men who loved her, and an unexpected death. I was trying so hard to do everything I could to get him to just, to just breathe. Was it suicide or murder? He always said that he was going to die young. I just couldn't believe that he was right. Stay with us. Christina and Sean Cleland had their whole lives ahead of them. So did their 19-year-old neighbor, David Heinrich. But as Cynthia McFadden first reported in 2007, their lives would become tragically intertwined. And one night, one decision would leave a trail of questions. How did a young man wind up dead in his own apartment? It was called an impossible knot. The story behind it would prove as difficult to untangle as the knot itself. The knot secured a noose. The noose was at the end of a rope attached to the living room wall, pulled tight by the body it held. There on the black sofa, a young man. Broken cigarette in the right hand, suicide note in his left. Dear Christina, it read, I don't love you. You need to go back to your husband. It was Christina who would come upon the body. I turn the light on and that's when I see the ropes. And I, for a whole second, I stood there because my eyes were lying to me. And I didn't want to believe it. It was on the night of October 2nd, 2005 in Brunswick, Ohio, that David Heinrich was found in his own home. It appeared he'd taken his own life. 33, in a strange coincidence, David's father, Guy, was at home, half listening to the police scanner. That night, his hobby would bring him the most horrible of news. I heard David's name and information come over the airwaves. It was late at night, and I thought, I better get over there and see what's happening. Guy called David's mother, Gloria, who also raced to the scene. All I did the whole ride was say, God, please, no. I was hyperventilating. I was crying like mad. When I got to the apartment, I went 
upstairs and police officer opened the door. I explained to him that I heard my son's address on the police scanner. I wanted to make sure he's okay. And he had a sergeant come out and say that that my son was, that my son had passed away. And I thought about it and I thought, one of the 19 year old kids don't pass away. He was a treasure to me. And um, just a beautiful person. There are so many things that I don't have answers to. Why would a healthy, seemingly happy 19 year old suddenly take his life? Or did he? He had been stopped on a drug charge a few months earlier. Did David have enemies? Or had he been killed because of a romance gone bad? I grabbed the shears out of the kitchen and ran back around. And um, I first cut the rope off the wall. And then I didn't really. So then I cut the rope off the neck. And then I um, pulled him off the couch and set him on the floor and opened his airway. And I was talking to him. I'm like, I'm right here. Don't worry. I was trying so hard to do everything I could to get him to just, to just breathe. It had all become so terribly tangled. Like the scene of his death, there was far more to David Heinrich's life than met the eye. He'd say, Dad, I don't feel like I'm going to live to be an old, old man. He always said that he was going to die young. I just couldn't believe that he was right. There were times that I felt like it was all a dream, like David never existed. David had called me about 2 o'clock that afternoon and didn't get a hold of me, and he left a message. He said, Mom, I'm going to take a shower. I'll call you back. So I erased it. I, you, I can't even tell you how heartbreaking, because those were the last words. I, you know, I'll never hear his voice again. And it, I erased it. His parents would later discover that the end of David's life was intimately tied to a romance that began thousands of miles away in Hawaii, a place he had never been. When we come back, the other man in Christina's life. I was head over heels in love. And signs of a marriage headed for trouble. When he gets upset when he drives, he'll start going like 100, 110 miles an hour, weaving through traffic, and you were scared for your life. Stay with us. Nineteen-year-old David Heinrich has been found dead in his apartment. It appears to be a suicide. But why would he take his own life? Or did he? Once again, Cynthia McFadden. To unravel the mystery of David Heinrich's life, we have to go back to 2001 at an isolated Hawaiian beach. A young soldier drops to one knee and asks a girl he has known only a few weeks to marry him. His name is Sean Cleland, hers Christina Eichelberger. In marrying Sean, 18-year-old Christina sees a way out of her strict Mormon upbringing. I think it was that longing to be loved that I had been searching for for so long. And here this, this guy came up and swept me off my feet, literally. And I was head over heels in, in love when we were first together. It was a whirl, whirlwind romance, it really was. Sean was a handsome high school wrestler. He was 19 when his parents divorced, an event that would unleash a powerful rage in him. But meeting Christina seemed to erase all of that. So tell me about her when you first met her. What did you see when you saw her? Oh. I mean, just this look in her eyes that, that just, just radiated kindness and love and everything that I had been lacking since my, basically since my parents divorced. After two and a half months, Sean and Christina were secretly married in a small ceremony at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. Well, this is the definition of whirlwind romance. I was naive. <laughs> Very naive. I can look back and admit it. I was such a newlywed, and people tell you, well, when you're newlywed, it's war and love, you know? But the perils of their young marriage would soon pale in comparison to the tragedy that would be left in their wake. As Christina and Sean Cleland were starting their new life, David Heinrich was just setting off on his. 
He was thousands of miles away in Ohio, unaware that his life would soon collide with theirs, and unaware of how much pain life could bring. As a little boy, what was he like? He was fun. He was a big Ninja Turtle lover. And if that kid had so many Ninja Turtles, you wouldn't believe. Outgoing, shy, what was he like? He was quiet. He was quiet. David had led a sheltered life, raised by two unmarried but devoted parents, homeschooled by his mother, his father's faithful sidekick. Would you say, being homeschooled, was he a little naive, do you think? Maybe. He was a non-threatening person. I think because he wasn't combative and he always was a good-natured person, he may have been guilty of not thinking people were so bad. I love you. At 18, the shy young man who loved music and video games proudly got his first job as a barista at Starbucks and rented an apartment just a few miles from his father, whose new young son, David, adored. You know, I saw him every day. If it wasn't stopping in to see him at work, I'd stop in and see him at the apartment or spend time with him and, you know, we'd spend the evening together. We just spent time doing things that buddies do and, uh... Yeah, you really socialize together. Right, right. Two years after they got married, Christina and Sean Cleland left Hawaii and moved to Ohio to this apartment complex where they crossed paths with David, moving in right next door to him. While David was enjoying his newfound independence, Christina and Sean began to argue over Sean's desire to stay in the military. Basically, since I was a little kid, my whole family's been in the, in the military, so that's basically what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. For a time, I wanted to be a JAG attorney. I always knew I wanted to join the military. Christina wanted him to quit, and for a while, Sean tried to please her, agreeing to make a fresh start, leaving the military for civilian life. But after losing two jobs in a row, he gave up. He didn't feel that he could make it as a civilian. He missed the uniform. He felt it was a sign from God to go back into the military. We had discussed when we first were together that he would not make it a career, and here he is about to make it a career. Did you say to him, look, I don't want you to do this? I said, if you go, I know that, that it's going to be the end of us because we have been apart more than we've been married. And I don't know who you are. Tensions between Christina and Sean escalated. Were you ever really physically afraid of him? He would slam things down and there were times he would, you know, break things against the wall. So when he gets upset when he drives, and he'll start going like 100, 110 miles an hour, weaving through traffic and you are scared for your life. Sean tells her he has an opportunity to go to Texas for training as a military medic, and he wants to go. So what happened? He went to Texas. So he went to Texas. And she stayed behind. She got a job as a bartender and became friends with the young man next door, David Heinrich. Though at this point, she says, they were just friends. She was far from giving up on her marriage. She even headed to Texas to see Sean. I went and got um, some very, very nice like lingerie. And I came out and I surprised him. He had the television on. He looks over at me and says, you look good. And looks over at the television and switches the channel. And I am like, are you kidding me? Did I tell you he was maybe seeing someone else? Oh, yes. In fact, he was having an affair with a female cadet in Texas. A hurt and angry Christina returns to Ohio, where David consoles her, and their friendship turns to romance. She moves in with him and makes sure Sean, who by this time has returned to his military unit in Hawaii, knows all about it. Sean is incensed. He's trying to call you and prolong the conversations and tell you he loves you, he wants you back. But what's the thing that happens that gets him on his feet, gets him to leave Hawaii and come to Ohio? The worst thing that I ever did, Sean had called and me and David were out running errands. So I got on the phone and Sean's, you know, I love you, I want you, I miss you. I was like, you need to stop this. And he goes, well, just hear me out. In three months' time, he's going to be have his way with you and he's going to be done. And so... I turned the phone to the side and I said, are you going to be tired of me in three months? And he said, 
no way, babe. And I think that might have been the starting point there. With that, Sean's battle to win Christina back begins in earnest. Faced with the loss of his wife to another man, Sean frantically tries to win Christina back. On September 8th, Sean sends Christina pictures of himself at the beach where he proposed to her. The next day, his phone calls increase. One day, he calls 87 times in 30 minutes. For nearly three weeks, Sean wages a desperate campaign, and then silence. Two days of silence. It would be the quiet before the storm. When we come back, Christina's husband pays her a surprise visit. Your ex is downstairs, and I'm like, excuse me? And asks her a chilling question. He said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? And I said, no, absolutely not. Stay with us. Christina Cleland has separated from her husband, Sean, and moved in with a new man in her life, David Heinrich. The couple believes Sean is thousands of miles away in Hawaii, but he's about to reappear in their lives. Once again, Cynthia McFadden. On October 1st, 2005, Christina and David wake up late. They sense something strange. Christina says something threatening. There was something about the air that was, it was very heavy. So let's talk about the day. Let's start at the beginning and, and, and take me through what happened. The day. I've told this story a hundred times and I know it by heart. <laughs> Even if I hadn't retold it before. Just stop. I mean, this is the day that someone you care deeply about died and yet you start off by a little laugh. It's unbelievable. I can step in a very objective role. I'm watching it like on a screen. So it's more of like a fly's eye view or something, you know. That day, a series of events would unfold that no one could have prepared for. At noon, Sean Cleland arrives from Hawaii. He had gone AWOL. The devoted military man had left his military base without permission. He rents a car at Alamo Rental where the clerk will later say he seemed menacing, angry, determined. Cleland leaves the airport and begins driving south. Meanwhile, Christina leaves home and heads for work at Johnny's Bar on Pearl Road. And then David calls her. What she hears next will send a chill up her spine. 15, maybe 20 minutes later, he calls me. Your ex is downstairs. And I'm like, excuse me? He's buzzing at the door. He was supposed to be in Hawaii. He was supposed to be in Hawaii, where he was living. I didn't know why he was there. Sean Cleland is frantically buzzing apartment number 121, over and over, relentlessly, shattering the quiet day. A terrified David calls the police. He said, like, don't worry, I already called the police. They're on their way. And I said, okay, don't go downstairs. So the police came and they shoot Sean off. Now, but why do you immediately go to, he's going to be violent? All he's done so far is rung the buzzer. Because it's the worst case scenario that I can imagine. And in my mind, the worst case scenario was that Sean and David would get into a fight. Enraged that David called the police, Sean spins out of the parking lot and drives to Johnny's bar. He walks in and sits directly in front of Christina. Her heart stops. I go into the bar area and there's Sean sitting at my bar. I didn't want to flip Sean's switch because I was used to calming him down, keeping things cool. I figured if I could keep him in front of me, I knew where he was. He pulls out this big cigar and just starts to smoking it. And, and that struck me so odd. That had me nervous. He said, if David just disappeared, would you come back to me? And I said, no. Absolutely not. Sean stays for four hours, drinking beer after beer, begging, threatening, pleading with Christina to come back to him. He begins to unravel. Christina is frantic. Finally, he abruptly leaves the bar. For an hour, two hours, there is no sign of Sean. 
Wondering where he'd have gone, Christina is beside herself. While just a few miles away at Starbucks, David helps clean up shop and heads for home. Within an hour, Christina herself closed up and bolted out the door, rushing home to David. I got in the car and I just, I sped all the way home. I ran through every light, every stop sign, I did not stop. I pulled into the parking lot when, every time I'd pulled in before, he always had the blinds open, watching TV, waiting for me, I had candles lit or something, you know? Blinds were closed, the entire apartment was dark. Something was not right. And then she saw David. And it looked like he was asleep on the couch. And that's when I see the ropes. I, for a whole second, I stood there because my eyes were lying to me. And I dropped everything that was in my hands and I ran over to him and he was so warm. Could not find the cell phone, did not have a house phone. Got the neighbor to call 911. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Came back and, and started on the CPR. That's where everything starts to get kind of just starts to spiral. Police start to piece together what happened. Was it a suicide as the note made it seem? But then why the cigarette butts and the scattered photo? It was Christina who solved the mystery. It was the knot. When she saw the knot on the rope around David's neck, Christina says she immediately recognized the work of her estranged husband, Sean. There's a special knot that he always used to close his laundry bag when he was in the field so people wouldn't steal his clothes. It's called the impossible knot, and I knew when I saw that that was him. It was around 1 a.m. when she told the police her suspicions. She knew time was of the essence. Sean was scheduled to fly back to Hawaii at 6.30 that morning. Police rushed to the airport, and there they found him, appearing perfectly relaxed. He'd been sending text messages to his new girlfriend in Hawaii, talking about marriage. 2.46 a.m., I wonder where you'll get your gown. At 2.52 a.m., an all-American military wedding sounds great. In searching Sean's bag, police found erotic pictures of Christina that matched the same batch of intimate photos found scattered near David's body. It was those photos, he would later tell police, that pushed him over the edge. The video camera set up next to his bed. I saw the pictures of my wife naked. I saw handcuffs in my wife's dresser, lingerie everywhere. He broke quickly. And then I enraged you to the point where you killed him. That's what ended up happening. I didn't, I didn't want to kill him. I just, I couldn't stop. I checked this post and I just ran. I, I, Sean talked to the police for 36 minutes. Okay. I was scared. I was freaking out. I had just assaulted this guy, put a noose around his neck. Because he was dead, that's and why he got scared. Correct? He wasn't dead yet, he had a pulse. He had a pulse when I left. But then you assume he was going to die? There was a possibility, yeah. It crossed my mind that he could die. Sean tells police that after leaving the bar, he broke into David and Christina's apartment and waited alone in the dark. I mean, this was a man who climbed three stories up, went over a roof, dropped down on a balcony, went in and waited for the victim. Medina County Prosecutor Dean Holman. He not only prepared the fake suicide note, he rigged the crime scene so it looked like a suicide, then put a cigarette in his hand and it left the suicide note there. People sometimes say the gun went off before. I didn't mean it to. You can't strangle someone by accident. No, this was a, this was a cold, calculated, planned act. When David arrived home from work, Sean jumped him and knocked him to the ground, strangled him, and then fled the scene, staging the suicide. Sean Cleland pled guilty. There would be no trial. But on the eve of sentencing, he said he wanted to change his plea, that his confession was a lie. We went to see him in prison to find out what he now says really happened. He tells me a strange story about a man hiding in the back of his car that night at the bar. The man he says was the real killer. I, I just got in the car. The guy popped up as soon as I started to back out of the parking spot. What happened then? He basically made me drive to the apartments, uh, had me by the arm, 
had his hand in the pocket with the gun that he had, takes me into the apartment, has me sit down, ties up my hands and feet, and has me just wait. Until, then what happened? Uh, when David Heinright came home, a uh, man jumped up, grabbed him, slammed the door, and attacked him, and eventually killed him. As you watched? Yes. He claims the real killer threatened him, that if he told what happened, he would kill his niece. The fact that you confessed twice to the police, to your father, and to your attorney at the time, we should disregard those confessions. Because you were lying then, and you're telling the truth now. Yes. I wonder if you'd believe this story if someone told it to you. Probably not. <laughs> Seriously, probably not. And to the people who say, this sounds like a made-up story given by a man who doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in prison, you say? I really don't know what to say to them. I'm telling the truth. But the judge refused to let Sean withdraw his plea. At his sentencing, Sean Cleland stood alone and faced the grieving family and friends of David Heinrich. He said just 13 words. Your Honor, I am truly sorry for the death of this young man. He was sentenced to 28 years to life in prison. It was little solace. My son was a treasure. My son, his life is worth something. What do you wish you could redo, undo, change? I just like to go back to that week and not come home. When you've been going through all of this, essentially your husband murdered someone. Oh, yes. For you, is what he would say. Yeah. Christina, in your heart of hearts, do you feel guilty at all for what happened? I am not guilty for Sean committing the crime because that was his part. I am guilty for being the link, and I know this, and I accept that role and that responsibility. Coming up on 2020 on ID. Can you tell if your dad is breathing? There's blood pouring out of his head. A man with a mask. It hits you as something horrific. A story that doesn't add up. And I remember we were just... What? And a brother and sister accusing each other. Who was the masked intruder that came into your house at 4 a.m.? It was Nathan. I didn't do it. My sister blames me for everything, and she always has. A picture emerges of a family in turmoil. It got to the point where I thought she was going to kill me. And two teenagers bent on revenge. Do I honestly feel like they can seriously hurt me? You have to be a little empty inside to take the person who loved you so much. Who really pulled the trigger and why? Timothy McNeil did not deserve to end up like that. Siblings driven to kill. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. By all appearances, lawyer Tim McNeil was not the kind of father, brother, husband and friend anyone would have reason to kill. He was hardworking, good-natured. He seemed to care deeply for his family. So when Tim was murdered in his own home, no one immediately suspected anyone close to him. But there was one key witness, his 17-year-old stepdaughter. And as detectives dug deeper, they began to uncover the roots of a primal tragedy long in the making. As Mary Fulginiti first reported in 2009, those roots sometimes grow where they're least expected. There's a house on a quiet street in the hills of San Diego. With its distant ocean views and scenic sunsets, it looks like a typical house. But inside, a terrible secret. The pool of blood has been cleaned up. The four bullet holes filled in. The house is silent now, but it wasn't then. Can you tell if your dad is breathing? He shot him in the head. Okay. Do you know if he shot him in the head or in the stomach or? 
you shot him, and then at, at least one thing, I hope you can see blood pouring out of his head. Okay. It was a beautiful day when a man dressed in black burst into the house of well-to-do lawyer Timothy McNeil and his 17-year-old stepdaughter, Bray. We asked for the combination to the safe. Okay, so we asked for the combination to the safe. What'd your dad do? He refused, and then he shot him. Okay. Detectives J.C. Smith and Brett Burkett got the call from dispatch. They told us it was a home invasion robbery and that uh, the victim had been tied up that there was a surviving victim. So as you're driving to the crime scene, any thoughts going through your head? I mean, we talked about how brazen it would be for someone to do this in the middle of the afternoon and, and uh, who might do such a terrible thing. And that doesn't typically happen, I would it, expect. It, in these it's meetings. unusual, I mean, especially since Tim McNeil didn't live a, a high-risk lifestyle. He's not your typical homicide victim. Okay. We were hoping that the patrol guys were, uh, were on the trail of the the masked gunman that ran out the back door. So this is the door you came through? Yeah, this is the door that we came through. Uh, Mr. McNeil's body was laying on the floor here with his head towards the pool table and his feet towards the door. And um, what I saw first uh, was the large amount of blood. It, it just, uh, it hits you as something horrific. And now the news is starting to spread. Neighbors are shocked to hear the, the TV was on, so I walked into the family room and I looked up and I saw Tim's house with all this yellow tape and everything. And Rick and Bonnie are Tim's brother and sister-in-law. When you got there, Rick, what, what went through your mind and your heart? God, no, God, no, you know. I just kept screaming, where's Bray, where's Bray, where's Bray? Is Bray okay? Was anybody else in the house at the time the officers first entered? When the first officers arrived, Bray was in the corner. Was she crying? Uh, she was upset, and her hands were bound behind her back. Hands zip-tied behind her, Bray tells police she managed to dial 911 with her tongue. It was horrible to hear the news of my father, and I, it physically, I just fell apart. For Bray's stepsister, Erin, the shock of their father's death almost equaled by her concern for Bray. I was livid that this poor girl he had witnessed one of the most heinous things happen to her father. And I just was like, how is she going to come back from this? How is she going to do this? Outside on the patio, police find a 357 Magnum revolver. And where was the gun located? Right on the top staircase right here. In tracing the killer's getaway route, police find a black shirt thrown high in this tree. And two eyewitnesses who caught a glimpse of the murderer running up this path before getting into a truck and taking off. Back at the police station, a shocked Bray gives police more details. The first thing I see is my dad standing sideways and the person all in black. A black ski mask and sunglasses obscured his face. Strangely, his voice was obscured in an odd way. He disguised his voice as a cartoon character. It was a high-pitched, kind of squeaky. It seemed at first like a robbery gone bad, but detectives wonder. Why would a robber disguise his voice? That's when we were like, oh. Because you're, you know, a home invasion robber, they want to sound like the boogeyman. They want to sound like Daffy Duck, you know? Unless this was someone Tim knew. Is there is there a client that... Uh, Disgruntled client. That was upset somebody. with him. But as they find out more about Timothy McNeil, they discover a man apparently without enemies. He's the coolest guy. I mean, he got along with everyone he met. He would start conversations with strangers. He liked all the best things in life. He loved good food. He loved, you know, hanging out with friends. And he was the best storyteller. He was really just a child at heart. Since his second wife, Doreen, died, Tim lived quietly here with Doreen's daughter, Bray. Her son, Nathan, was away at college in Arizona. Do you have any idea at that point who would want Tim McNeil dead? No. None or a motive or a reason or anything. But then Bray, while being questioned by the police, suddenly blurts out a name. I heard my dad ask him, why are you doing this, Nathan? And that's all I know. He didn't, he didn't say that's not my name or that's not who I am or he didn't deny it. Nathan? Could the killer be her own brother? Tell us about the slip Bray made. She said this name, Nathan. And she goes, uh, but she said, it's not my brother. My brother's named Nathan, but it's not him. 
And I remember we were just, what? It seemed impossible. Nathan, a clean-cut honors student, his life an open book on YouTube. Hello there, YouTube people. My name is Nathan Gant. Interested in girls? A little goofy, but full of promise. And if Nathan killed their stepfather, why would Bray shield him? She adored her stepdad, Tim. Dad was daddy. And, I mean, he raised her. I mean, that was dad. But police are beginning to think Bray is holding back important information. Maybe you call it our police sixth sense. Either she was holding up very well for what she had just seen, right. or there's a lot more to her story. But why would Bray or Nathan want Tim dead? When they were four and six, Tim married their mother, school teacher Doreen Hansen, and made them part of his family. How did Tim treat Bray and Nathaniel? Oh, well, I mean, they were his kids. He treated them just like any other, just like he treated me. But behind all this, a terrible secret, a family in turmoil. Their mother, Doreen, was suicidally depressed and had been abusing Nathan and Bray from an early age. Did you ever hear her uh, demean Bray or berate Bray or put her down or make her feel worthless? In my so? opinion, yes. Yes. Did you ever see her say, I love you? Oh, no. No. To ever see her put her arm around Bray to comfort her, to console her? No. For Nathan, it was much worse. What did Nathaniel go through growing up? She was physically violent with, with him, hitting him, um, hit him with uh, sticks, um, ridicule him. He would be in the bathroom, bring his sister in and point out his penis and ridicule him about it in front of his sister. And then the names, I mean... Uh, and what were some of the names? She called him, you know on a regular basis when you ask Nathan and Bray about it even now you hear that odd detached tone abused children often resort to she threw things at me like what kind of things like kitchen appliances and knives she would throw knives at you mm -hmm. she... like she was gonna kill you yeah well she had threatened to kill me several times uh, she had told me that she was gonna kill me and bury me in Mexico how old were you at the time Eight, nine. She would just say, you know, what would you do if I, you know, drove off the Coronado Bridge? What would you do if, you know, I just burnt the house down? And this is when I'm, you know, ten, seven. Why was she saying all these things, Jimmy? Was she sick? There was something that was not uh, all, all the way right with my mother. In a childhood of chaos, one oasis of sanity. Was there anyone in the house you felt you could trust? Tim. Uh, did... Tim just stand there and watch it happen, or did he ever defend you or try to defend you? You know, he would just, he'd step and dream, that's enough. It was Tim who arranged for 12-year-old Nathan to go live with his grandmother in Arizona to escape the abuse at home. His name was rarely mentioned after that. It was really weird because I was still a kid, and it was never spoken about to me. He was just gone. Away from his mother, Nathan blossomed and became an honors student. But Doreen's condition was getting worse, and she was taking it out on her daughter. How bad did it ultimately get? It got to the point where I had to move to Tucson because I thought she was going to kill me. 16-year-old Bray was living with her brother, now a college student in Arizona, when a tragedy took place. My mom called and threatened suicide. It wasn't the first time, and Nathan was fed up. And she said that she was going to die. She was like, I need to talk to Bray. And, um... I guess I was asleep. I said, well, when she wakes up, I'll have her call you. So you didn't take her seriously? No. And she goes, fine, and click, hangs up. I didn't know that she had already taken a whole handful of pills. <laughs> Their stepfather, Tim, found her dead the next morning. I guess she just wanted to say goodbye. Were you crying? Were you upset? Or were you relieved that this was, woman who was a monster to you is now gone? I was bawling. I couldn't stop crying for days. Yet you still loved her? I have to. You don't have to love anybody. I believe that you have to love everyone. For two kids who had spent their lives trying to earn their mother's love, it was a devastating loss. And now, a year later, their stepfather dead as well, and both are under suspicion for his murder. The question everyone is asking is why? Why would a caring stepfather end up dead? 400 miles away in Arizona, police put that question to Nathan. He says he wasn't even there. I didn't do anything, though. I, I need a lawyer. This is, this is too powerful. This is just... 
I, 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 I'm trying to tell you guys I wasn't involved. Good luck to you. Police also question Bray, who raises their suspicions. Were you surprised the killer no left her alive? To leave a witness to that, it seemed unusual. Unusual things start to add up. Less than 10 hours after the murder, Bray sees a police artist sketch of a man witnesses saw running away from the murder house. And they're on the internet looking at the sketch, and Bray said she never saw the face of the killer. But when the sketch came out, she said, no, his jaw was more square-like. The police read Bray her rights, turn on a video camera, and then the statement no one saw coming. I'm usually not like this. I don't know if I need some treatment or what. You think you should be charged with anything? I did kind of start the whole thing, even if it was, I don't know, lapse of judgment or whatever. And I mentioned to one of my friends, Nikki, that like I wished I could, but that was about it. You wish you could what? I wish I could, like, kill my dad or whatever. Coming up, both Bray and Nathan stand trial for Tim McNeil's murder. What the evidence shows is that a conspiracy to kill Timothy McNeil existed between Bray Hansen and her brother. And a sister turns on her brother. He said this is going to happen whether or not you want it. And if you're smart, you'll go along with it or you'll end up just like him. Who really killed Tim McNeil? Stay with us. San Diego attorney Tim McNeil has been shot to death in his own house, and his stepchildren, Bray and Nathan, are prime suspects. But which of them is the cold-blooded murderer, or are they both guilty? As Mary Fulgeniti reports, a brother and sister once close are about to find themselves at odds with each other. They're both there, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't matter who pulled the trigger. It was Nathan. I didn't do it. I think it's the only time I've ever really had my heart broken. Almost two years after the murder of Tim McNeil, the trial that will decide who killed him is about to begin. All right. A brother and sister, both charged with first-degree murder. She says he did it. Who was the masked intruder that came into your house at 4 a.m.? It was Nathan. He says she must have done it because he wasn't even there. Tell me then, if you didn't kill your dad, what did you do that day? Where were you that day? I'm not allowed to talk about that day. But who's telling the truth? There are two brilliant lawyers for the defense, and the knives are out. She tried everything she could to stop her brother, Nathan Gann, from killing their father, Timothy McNeil. So even if you have to bury the brother, if it saves the client, that's what you sometimes have to do. A absolutely. She confided in friends that she wanted to have her stepfather killed or wanted him dead. You alluded that the killer mm. could be prey. If that's what the evidence shows, then that's what I'll argue without second thought. They're up against veteran prosecutor George Bennett, who says the defendants are both guilty. And what the evidence shows, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, is that a conspiracy to kill Timothy McNeil existed between Bray Hansen and her brother. The prosecution's trump card, Bray's confession to the cops. I did kind of start the whole thing, even if it was, I don't know, lapse of judgment or whatever. She admits to making the initial phone call to her brother, but says it was really Nathan who made it happen. They hear her entire confession, and it is damning. I still can't believe I did this. <laughs> it's not like me. Jurors listen spellbound as she describes her brother's instructions. She puts a spare key, a gun that once belonged to her mother, and money into a box on the back patio where he can find it. You made a key. I did. You took cash out of your account. I did. And you got the gun. I did. And you put all those items in a box and you left them on the back doorstep for the killer to get. Yes, I did. She says the money was originally to pay for a hitman. But then on July 19th at 4 a.m., she says she's awakened by Nathan, dressed all in black. He came in at 4 o'clock in the morning. Right. And he was like, here, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I thought this was over. I don't want to do this. Did he have a gun pointed at you? Yes, he did. And what did he say to you? 
He said this is going to happen whether or not you want it. And if you're smart, you'll go along with it or you'll end up just like him. The confession is riveting, but not all the jurors in the courtroom get to hear it. For if this is a case of two sibling suspects, it is also an example of a rare legal phenomenon, a single trial with two separate juries. Because some evidence is not admissible for both defendants, Bray and Nathan each get their own jury. You are the blue jury. You will start out here, uh, over where these folks are sitting right now. That's where the red jury will sit. One trial, two juries, two alternate versions of the truth, and two lawyers who are working all the angles. Hypothetically speaking, mm -hmm. two different juries, you could have two different verdicts. Yes, you could. You could end up walking out with one client uh, being acquitted and the other client being found guilty of, um, you know, of murder. If you two start pointing the finger, it could actually work to both of your benefits, because each of them could get off. You know, that's certainly their benefit. That's helpful to Bray and to Nathaniel. They both get to go home. That's a prospect too hard to bear for stepsister Erin. You have to be a little empty inside and not know truly what love brings to your life to take the person who loved you so much from your life. But why would either kill their stepfather? In her confession, Bray paints a picture of a younger sister being controlled by her older brother. That's when he said, you know, we're going to do this and you're going to help or else. Why didn't you call the police then? He's my brother. A brother hellbent on revenge for childhood slights. Motivations begin to emerge. Do you understand yeah, why he was doing it? He eventually started saying something about how Tim had um, not been a good enough father to him. He hadn't been a good enough father to me. They had a lot of issues. And he knew I didn't want to go through with it. But I did anyway, so it's my fault. On the tape, she seems to accept partial responsibility. So happened, but at times, like, she appears curiously like, unemotional, even cavalier. How don't you guys catch us? That's what we do for a living. Don't look at it away. But were Bray and her brother in cahoots? Or was Bray trying to set up Nathan to take the fall? We've talked to some really bad people in our career. She's in the top two of the most callous. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Perhaps equally damning, a detective testifies about driving Bray to the station for questioning only minutes after the murder. And I noticed movement coming from where uh, Bray Hansen was sitting. When I turned to look at her, she was like dancing in her seat, and she made the comment that she liked the song that was on the radio. What was the song on the radio? Big Girls Don't Cry. Do you cry? I try not to. Why? Because I don't like crying. It makes me feel weak. And the police officers say when they took you away from the crime scene that you were dancing in the car. <laughs> Did it bother you? We still talk about it. We it still absolutely about bothered us. But the big question is why? When we come back for the first time, what no jury got to hear. Tim comes home, I tie him up. Why Bray wanted the man she adored and called her daddy to die. I wanted him to hurt like he had hurt me. When we come back. Bray Hansen and her brother Nathan Gann are on trial for the murder of their stepfather, Tim McNeil. The prosecution's case rests largely on Bray's chilling confession, but with separate juries, Will that be enough to convict both siblings? Once again, Mary Fulgeniti. Her jury hears the videotape confession. He's like, okay, you know, I'm going to have to shoot him. His jury does not. What does he have Instead, what Nathan Gann's yeah, jury hears is a question. case based almost solely on circumstantial evidence about the day his stepfather was murdered. Police found a piece of clothing in a, in a tree thrown off to the side. Up in the tree, there was a, a bundle of clothing. There's a black shirt and a black mask. The shirt police found thrown away on the killer's escape path had nothing to tie it to Nathan. 
But the mask found inside the shirt comes back as a match for Nathan's DNA. Uh, Mr. Gann matches the DNA that I obtained. But Nathan's lawyer proves the first time they tested the mask, it was not a match. Could the sample have been contaminated? Round one, a draw. Can you make an identification of this person you saw? A witness puts Nathan at the scene. Is that gentleman right there? More or less. But I can't say I'm absolutely 100% positive. Another witness says the assailant got into a truck on this road. One of the neighbors actually saw him get inside the truck. It matched the description of Nathan's truck almost perfectly. If he doesn't see the paint, then it's not Mr. Gann's truck. Do you solemnly state under penalty? Most damning, perhaps, a jailhouse informant says Nathan confessed and seemed to know details only the killer would know. He said when he was running up the stairs, he threw him over the side and they got caught in the tree. But Nathan's lawyer paints the informant as a liar. Is this the kind of guy you trust when he tells you a story? Is this the kind of guy you believe? For the juries, perhaps the most intriguing question is why? Why would Bray or Nathan have killed their stepfather? Even the prosecutor doesn't seem to know. Nobody can really explain this case. You think of motive and you think of a reason. And there isn't one. But as the trial proceeds, yeah, possible motives right? emerge. For Bray, who had gotten used to having Tim all to herself, suddenly a rude awakening. Tim meets someone. He was already there, sitting at the bar, and so I sat down, and he turned around at one point and saw me and kind of did a double take, and I just said, hello. <laughs> Her name was Kim, a woman as calm as Doreen had been troubled. It was a fateful meeting in a bar that would end up changing this family forever. Tim was instantly smitten. I swear he's like a teenager. It was so wonderful to see him so happy because he'd gone through a lot. Um, and I was just so happy that he'd found someone. He was basically going to cut me out of his life completely. I knew he had already chosen his girlfriend over me. Mm -hmm. And I knew it hurt really, really bad because this is the man that I thought right. loved me and was my dad. It wasn't just me. She didn't want anybody in the picture. I think it was about that she just didn't want anybody else in Tim's life that she would view as competition. Do you think she was genuinely threatened by you? Yes. Tim was starting to think about retirement and moving in with his new girlfriend. He asked Bray, now about to turn 18 and in college, to leave the nest. There was a confrontation. There was a big fight between Tim and Bray. Do you have any idea what that was about? He was just so incredibly frustrated with her behavior and her choices. Kim says a jealous Bray began rebelling and pushing against rules. But Tim was tolerant until a fender bender finally pushed him over the edge. He was contacted by an insurance company that she had done a hit and run accident. We had got into an argument and he basically had said that I wasn't his daughter, that I was worthless and he didn't know why he had ever let someone like me think that she could be his daughter but I wasn't good enough for any teenage girl those were crushing words but for a girl who had endured years of rejection from her mother catastrophe and so the phone call that Bray says began everything you have these feelings that you want to kill Tim or you want Tim to be dead you call Nathaniel what do you say to him I basically ask him to calm me down you know, tell him, I told him, you know, these things are going through my head. Please, you know, make them go away, you know. And instead, what did he say? Instead, he said, well, you know, what if he weren't there anymore? And I was like, well, you know, that would be kind of cool. Why didn't you say, no, Nathan, I'm just having crazy thoughts? I was very hurt. I was very angry. I wanted him to hurt like he had hurt me. So you devised a scheme to kill him? I guess you could say that, yes. A plot begun by Bray. But she says it all came from Nathan. Whose idea was it to make a key and get cash? Nathan's. Whose idea was it to use a gun? Nathan's. Whose idea was it to stage it as a burglary? Nathan's. Take me through that day. What was the plan? Tim comes home. Um, Tim comes home. I tie him up and Nathan leans him down in the laundry room and shoots him. In the moments before when you're upstairs and you hear him coming in, what's going through your mind? 
what the hell's going on, what's going to happen. I can't believe this is actually going to happen. Freaking out completely. Why did you hold your dad's hands when you were downstairs? I don't know. Did you look into his eyes? No. At one point, your hands are free. At one point, yes. Yeah, couldn't you have done something to stop it? For about 15 seconds. I mean, what was I going to do? Well, push Nathan. Kick him. It didn't even go through my head. Bray said it all happened in seconds. Suddenly, Tim and Nathan struggling for the gun, followed by a shot. The first gunshot goes off. What do you see? At first, I think that, you know, my dad shot him and, you know, it was all going to be okay. And then I see blood coming out of my dad and him fall to the ground. I mean, how quickly thereafter did the other three shots happen? Oh, five seconds. Did you see them go into Tim? Bray, what was going through your mind as you're watching your father get executed? Oh, my God. Were you screaming? Yeah. What were Tim's final words? You shot me. I can't believe you shot me. You killed me. But Nathan's lawyer says if those were Tim's last words, Bray listened to them all by herself. He says the prosecution can't even prove Nathan was in California that day, let alone in the murder house. Did you kill Tim McNeil? No. Did you threaten your sister? Did you tell her, if you don't go through with this, I'm going to kill you too? The worst threat that I ever gave my sister was that if you don't take care of your chores, you're going to your room. The prosecutor saved his harshest words for Bray. This is a monstrous crime. And finishes by reading from a letter Bray wrote in prison. It was supposed to be one clean shot, easy shot to the head. No pain, no suffering. I was supposed to be upstairs. She never tried to withdraw from any conspiracy. It just got messy. Timothy McNeil did not deserve to end up like that. And the only reason that he ended up like that is because of her and because of her brother. And those tears and that expression is too late. But the defense lawyers, speaking to their separate juries, do a brilliant job of finger pointing. Bray Hansen is right handed. Nathaniel Gann is left handed. And that gun was resting in what would be a natural right-handed orientation for him. She's forced to stand in this game room with her hands zip-tied behind her back while her brother proceeds to shoot her dad. As the two juries are deliberating, a terrible fear preying on the police. Could his jury think she did it and her jury think he did it? Because the police know something critical, the final twist. Another confession tape the jury never got to hear. I want him to honestly feel like take me seriously for sure. Two years after the murder of Tim McNeil, the trial of his stepchildren, Bray and Nathan, is drawing to a close. Once again, Mary Fulginiti. Two separate juries deliberating the fate of this sister and brother charged with the murder of their stepfather. Do not discuss your deliberations with anyone. Will they reach the same verdict? Or will one be convicted while the other goes free? So, you know, I think the now all the attorneys can do is wait. How long has the jury been out? Uh, they went out yesterday at about 1.40. Who knows what they're talking about in there? And I've given up speculating what jurors think about years ago because it just drives you crazy at this point it's uh, completely out of my hands bray admits to planning the killing but says she backed out nathan's defense is simple he says he's innocent and wasn't even in california when the crime occurred nathaniel why did you do it i didn't do it did you hate him that much i loved him i had more to gain by tim being alive than being dead while Nathan says he and Tim loved each other, the facts paint a more complicated picture. No photos of them together. No sign of Nathan and Tim's will. And while Tim did try to take his side against Doreen, he didn't stop her physical abuse. 
Your sister said that she put this plan in motion, but you're the one that came up with the details. Why would she blame you? Why would she implicate you if you had absolutely nothing to do with it? Well, my sister blames me for everything, and she always has. I, that's the older brother, younger sister complex. Nathan says it was Bray alone who killed Tim. Are you haunted by his pleas? Are you haunted by his final words to you, pleading for his life? I wouldn't know. He said, Nathan, why are you doing this? If he did, then there must have been someone else named Nathan there. He sounds pretty convincing, but there's one more twist to this story. I, I have... A big one. Did you kill Tim McNeil? No. Then why did you tell the cops you did? All right. In this videotaped interrogation, which took place in Arizona the day after the killing. Uh, what's going on at your address? Mm -hmm. And for what? Murder. Nathan at first professes shocked innocence. What do you mean? But the police keep pressing him. The bottom line is you're right. Tim is dead. Your mother's dead. Your sister's in jail. And you're sitting in here under arrest for murder. And Nathan goes from emotional to confessional. Struggle. Struggle. Sometimes you get so scared. And uh, after a mistake, it's just too much adrenaline. And, and it makes it so flash so quick and hard to really, really think about it. Would you mind if I did a quick demonstration? He even volunteers to reenact the killing. Well, Nathan, either you say yes or no if somebody asks you if you if you, know, you shot the fatal shot. You know, if I, it, why did you say yes? I don't recall. I don't. I don't think I said yes. Did you feel like you had to shoot him? Yeah. Well, after he was dying, put him out of his misery. I mean, what's the point? He stood over his head and shot him in the head, right? What's the point of that? So then sit there and please death. It was a clear confession of murder, all the more convincing given the rawness of his emotions. How did you feel, Nathan, when you went down? <sighs> and details that finally seemed to bring clarity as to why he aimed a gun at the man who helped raise him. Did he look scared? I just had a... I don't hear that. I mean, you know, it was you. He laughed. He laughed. In the end, police say it all came down to the one thing a son yearns for from his father. Respect. I remember Nathan saying that McNeil still didn't respect me. I wanted him to honestly feel like take me seriously for sure. I just, I just but neither jury, deliberating separately somewhere inside this building, knows anything about this confession. Because of a legal technicality, it was not introduced into evidence. Will the jury make the right decision? Will they decide it was the stepdaughter, jealous of the new woman in her dad's life? Or the stepson, disrespected by his dad for the last time? Hello. For the police, waiting for Nathan's verdict is nerve-wracking. Two days go by, no word. Day three. Day three. What are you guys thinking? Second guessing what the jury's doing and... All right. Finally, on the third day, which sibling would pay for this crime? It's my understanding you have made decisions in this case. When we come back, Madam Clerk, please read the verdicts.
Hansen and her brother Nathan Gann are on trial for murdering their stepfather. Now jurors will decide their fate. They've seen a lot of evidence, but one thing they didn't see is Nathan's videotaped confession. Will that affect the verdict? Now, with the conclusion of our story, Mary Fulgeniti. The moment of truth. And you have indicated that you have made decisions in this case. Is that correct, sir? Do you have the verdict forms? Please hand them to my bail. Nathan's verdict is read first. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Nathaniel Marcus Gann, guilty of the crime of murder in violation of penal code section... Nathan gets 25 years behind bars. His jury concludes he did not pull the trigger. The said defendant did not intentionally and personally discharge a firearm. the verdicts were fair here, Nathan, the trigger man, is not guilty of using a gun when you know he's the one that pulled the trigger. He's still guilty of first-degree murder. That's the bottom line, is I'm satisfied with the verdict. Bray's verdict is read the next day. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Bray F. Hansen, guilty of the crime of murder and fix the degree thereof as murder in the first degree. Ironically, Bray is found guilty of a gun charge, as well as lying in wait, which brings an automatic sentence of life without parole. Jurors were unanimous. I've cried every day. And yet it's the absolute right thing to do. Do you consider yourself to be a murderer? No. Even though you talked about killing Tip Neil. There's a difference between doing it in fantasy and actually pulling the trigger. I mean, I think the reason why the jury had difficulty was because you didn't stop it. In my mind, at the time, I did. When you're not thinking clearly, when you're in shock, when you're afraid, when you're just in such a frenzied state, you don't... You don't see all those possibilities. For the McNeils, closure. It's not going to bring Tim back, but at least there's justice, and we're grateful for that. If no diminishment of their anger. It wasn't a heart attack or a car accident. It was planned. It wasn't even a crime of passion by two teenagers that right. made a mistake. It was cold calculated execution but incredibly tim mcneil's daughter erin feels only grief what would you like to say to pray i mean i just wanted to i mean i haven't even hugged her i mean i just wanted to go and just tell her i don't know i'll miss you i'm mourning your i'm mourning the loss of you as much as i'm mourning the loss of my dad um i don't know it's uh, I don't even know what to say to her. I mean, I think it'll take my whole life to probably wrap my mind around it. In an unaddressed letter found in Bray's cell before the trial, she tries to explain herself. I know this will be hard for you to believe because you loved him so much, but so did I, and I still do. The letter that you heard about at trial, her lawyer told us earlier today that that letter, he felt, was going to be sent to you as an apology, as a way of explaining what happened. And that's why it's a tragedy. Erin told me something that I think you might want to know. She saw you in court for the first time. Her reaction was that she wanted to hug you when she saw you at trial. And she says she still loves you. Does that surprise you? does and why it's okay to cry no it's not why does it surprise you because as much as he was my dad he was her dad Anything you want to say to Erin? I'm sorry. If I could go back in time, I'm doing less than a heartbeat. But I can't. A brother and sister who say they grew up with everything but their mother's love. 
now grappling with the enormity of having taken their stepfather's life.